Hello everyone, this is GM Josh Fidel, and today I'll be doing another video in my autopsy series. For a reminder of those of you who haven't watched one before, basically the approach to this series is that I analyze a game, it could be a high level game, it could be a game between two amateurs, it could be a game of mine, which I guess is somewhere in between. <laughs> and basically I take a look from the losing side and I try to figure out how they lost. So that could mean looking at key decisions. It could mean explaining what I think maybe was wrong with their mindset, what they were calculating incorrectly, things like this. And of course, I'm going to throw in just some normal analysis as well, because I think, you know, it's interesting to look at some positions and it's just a normal thing to do. And I've been somewhat neglectful of this series this year, which I'm not too happy about, but... Uh, I've been actually working on a couple video series uh, for a new website, and I'll definitely share that with you guys when everything comes out and gets together. Uh, but for now, I've been working on that a lot, so I haven't really recorded any extra videos. But definitely, I've gotten a lot of support with this channel recently, and I just wanted to you know, keep up with it. So I really want to make it a, a more regular thing than it has been. In any case, uh, I wanted to go over a game from the World Team Championship, which just finished in Astana, Kazakhstan. This game, Michael Adams was white against Nils Grandelius. It was the last round. And as, as usual, we're going to look at it from Grandelius's point of view, which was the losing side of this game. So to start with, and just to fill you guys in, for those of you who don't know, I mean, Michael Adams, most of you should know, a very famous English GM who's been top five in the world though has been really struggling recently and had a very bad tournament here. Uh, and he's one of my favorite players, so it was a little bit sad to see, but he did manage to win this game. And Grandelius is a very, very talented Swedish GM uh, and a really original player. So if you haven't followed his games, I definitely recommend doing it. He plays Sicilian. Mickey plays Bishop B5 check, which is typical for him. And again, I, I usually am not going to analyze the opening too much because I want to focus on the decisions that made people lose. So unless something really interesting occurred in the opening, uh, I don't want to do it. A4 is kind of a, a trend that's somewhat recent. And again, it, the ideas are, there are a lot of ideas to it. I don't want to get too much into it. Uh, one of the main ones, though, is that if, if ever the bishop retreats after a move like A6, oftentimes you do stop B5, which is convenient, but uh, there are plenty of options. Anyway, E6 was played, knight C3, A6, bishop E2. But the nice thing with players like this, I would say neither player is super theoretical, so you often get a fresh position very early, which is kind of nice. Uh, because already this is a little bit of an unusual uh, setup. But Nils chooses to play Hedgehog, which is a very flexible, nice setup. There's no pawn on c4, so it's a little bit different than a lot of Hedgehogs. Uh, oftentimes the pawn on c4 actually helps black, because it gives a potential target, and it blocks white's bishop, but at the same time... The pawn on c4 also restricts the d5 push. In any case, d4 take take. Taking with the queen may look unusual, but the fact is that the knight on d4 often doesn't do that much. Playing f4 is usually a double-edged sword because it can create weaknesses, so taking with the queen is actually quite, quite normal here. Bishop b7, castles, knight f6, rook d1, and this was actually an interesting moment. Uh, most of the time, I think people agonize too much, especially if you're a time troubler. You agonize too much about decisions like this. Do I play queen c7? Do I play bishop e7 in castles? Which do I play? Okay, g6, bishop g7 is clearly not viable here because the d6 pawn is too weak. But in general, I think people agonize a lot over these decisions. But there are times when you want to be aware and at least take a few minutes. If you spend 20 minutes on this decision, you're probably making a mistake. But I'd say if you spend 30 seconds, unless you know the position for sure, you're also making a mistake. Because there are usual subtleties between queen c7 and bishop e7 and which order you play things in. There are positions where they don't matter. But in Hedgehog in particular, I think this kind of decision is actually quite relevant. So if you guys actually want to pause your video, you can do that and decide which move you like more because there are differences. Um, so why don't you go do that if you want to. Otherwise, I'm just going to trudge along. So the move queen c7 is actually quite logical to prevent a possibility that occurred in the game, which we'll get to. But the idea would be this is a normal square for the queen, and you dull the idea of e5, which is the idea that white would have otherwise. 
So the drawback to a move like this is often that white can play very quickly with a move like knight d2. And the point is that now black, okay, black has a couple different possibilities. Knight d2 looks weird, but the idea is if you get knight c4 in and you're not in position to guard d6, you can actually be embarrassed very easily. But in this particular case, I don't think that it's, I think black has ways to deal with it. First of all, d5 is possible and probably not horrible. I mean, you can play bishop c5 with tempo next. You can think about sacrificing, but even if you play, like, you know, after the queen moves, even if you just play ED, it's, like, probably okay for, for black. Uh, you could also take back immediately if you don't want to allow knight b3 with tempo, say. But, I don't know. Uh, probably it's okay for black, but also black can play a move like this. And the idea is that now if knight c4, you can, you can capture it. And if a move like f4, this queen is actually very sadly placed, and the knight can go to b4 next, and this is a very typical attack. That's quite annoying if you're not developed. So this this would be not advised uh, for white. So probably here white has to play some normal move and knight c4, knight b3, and life kind of continues. But in any case, it's not a big deal to allow knight d2. And bishop e3 is also possible, which is, would now bishop e7 could be very similar to the game. Uh, not quite because actually black never got in queen c7, but you could have transposed to it from the game. But here, black has the possibility of knight g4, which I find actually a little bit interesting, with the idea that after bishop g5, probably you throw an h6, and then the bishop is not always great over there. And you can play now knight g5, for instance, and it's quite an interesting position, I find. But I think that the bishop on h4 is actually often out of the action. You can put it on g3, but you're never really threatening to take the knight. So it's kind of an interesting possibility, uh, with the idea of discouraging this move. So in the game, bishop e7 was played. So this does two things. It allows e5. And the e5 is actually quite interesting here. Uh, for example, if you try to play very straightforward, these kind of positions can be problematic because white clearly has a lead in development, and it's not always so easy to catch up. So for example, if you play a move like queen c8 and I play bishop e3, you have to deal with this weakness, and you're already underdeveloped. So I would say it's problematic. Of course... White's not going to take immediately with something like this, but because of queen c6, of course. But even if white just plays a building move here, it's not not necessarily so easy to play uh, for for black because you just don't have that many improving moves here. Even a move like bishop f1, very solid, and I don't know exactly. Uh, sorry, bishop f1 is probably a very bad move <laughs> because of knight g4. But, for example, you could retreat the queen with a move like queen g3, and it's kind of difficult to play, because this pawn is under attack, bishop h6 is in the air, it's just very annoying. So this kind of thing is usually not great, and if you try to trade queens with a move like queen b8, I have plenty of options here, but even if I just trade queens and play bishop e3, it's, it's quite annoying to play a position like this, because again, you're just behind a development. Usually in the endgame, this kind of structure is very nice, because you, you secure the d5 square. But the problem is that you you have these weaknesses on the king side, which are very annoying to deal with. For example, you can't play knight d5, which you would like to play because of takes takes and this a6 pawn hangs. So this kind of thing is is tends to be very annoying and is one of the reasons why you don't want to do this. So probably you would have to give up your bishop, oops, and then take on e5, which is is a pawn winning idea. So it's not like this is horrible. But you definitely have to contend with a very strong bishop, a weak a6 pawn, so you probably have to play a move like rook a7 here. And now you have to deal with things like bishop e3 with a5 ideas. If you play a5, it's just positionally atrocious, and knight b5 comes in, so you can't do it. I would say white has really good compensation here, and this was a very viable possibility. But okay, I mean, not everyone wants to sack a pawn right away. Uh, Adams played bishop e3, which is also quite a reasonable option. And here also, there's an issue, because... That knight g4 possibility, which is another line I think is quite viable, here runs into queen takes g7. So it's kind of one of the subtle differences between bishop e7 and queen c7. That the bishop on f8 guards this pawn. So here, you can play queen c7 now, but now knight d2 is stronger, I think, because the bishop on e3 is developed. So a lot of the possibilities you had, like d5 and all these lines, are, are worse for you because this bishop is simply developed. So, an idea like this could be actually quite annoying. So he opts to castle. But castling does allow that possibility that Mickey played in the game, which is e5. 
So basically, the, the lesson from all this, I mean, obviously there's lots of hedgehog subtleties. I, I, I don't really play the hedgehog very much for either color, so I can't claim to be an expert on all these. But it's more that you want to be thinking about these things a little bit during the game. I don't want to claim that you should spend all your time or anything like that, but you want to be aware. Okay, can white play e5 if I don't play queen c7? Is knight d2 to c4 a possibility? And really thinking about your opponent's ideas. Because if you're cut off guard by moving e5, you could just be much worse already. That's not really the case here, but... And I'm not saying even that Grandelius was cut off guard. I'm saying from your point of view that if you play a position like this, you want to make sure e5 you're ready for all the time. Knight d2 to c4, you have an answer. I'm not saying you're going to have a perfect answer or that these uh, you can always do so much against these ideas. There are times they're just strong... But you want to at least be aware of them and have a planned response. Um, because if you end up missing one of these moves and don't, don't anticipate it, then that's when problems can arise in the opening for you here. So again, a lot of it's just about being aware. So here, Mickey had a slightly different idea. So Black did capture this bishop. And here, rather than recapturing, he takes on d6. So this is kind of his idea and that the bishop is now trapped. So he takes here, knight takes. There's no rush to take this bishop. Uh, but Grandelius plays very sensibly. He blocks the d-file with his knight and attacks the e3 bishop. They trade. Mickey plays knight c3. Grandelius takes, takes. So positions like this, I think, are very deceitful. Uh, I've had my share, again, of positions like this. The game is simplified. You don't have any horrible weaknesses, materials even, and people tend to relax. And I would say that this is a very dangerous thing because I can tell you from experience that positions like this can go awry very quickly. Even if you're 100% equal here, you can end up not equal very fast. So you have to make sure that your moves and your play are precise here. Again, it doesn't mean you spend 20, 30 minutes on a move, but it means that you make your choices very clearly. Uh, and carefully, because I would say in this position, Grandelius maybe, maybe he missed stuff, but I think he underestimated the possible dangers to his own position here. Because the fact is that white, okay, white is the only one with open file for now. It's very likely this file is going to be contested very soon, but for the moment, white is slightly more active pieces. I would say that the pawn structure is mixed, because again, if black secures a knight on d5, often this is a nice structure and whatnot, but... I would say for the moment, black's pawns are slightly weaker than white's. So what that means is that maybe black is completely equal. Maybe white's slightly better. Again, I, I would favor white very slightly. I don't think you've equalized yet. But the fact is that you still have to play a precise move. So again, if you want to pause your video and, and try to find what you would play here, that's, uh, that's not a bad idea. Um, otherwise, I'm going to keep going. So basically... A move like h6 is always kind of okay, just because you, you're you creating Luft, which you're going to have to do. It's not going to be a wasted move, because you're going to have to do it. But it does allow white to kind of choose how they're going to build. They can play rook d2, rook d1, rook d4, rook d1. They can play maybe knight e4, trying to go to d6 as possible. Not my favorite, just because I don't think it's a stable square, but it's definitely something you always have to watch out for. But a move like h6 is, is probably not horrible. But I would probably choose rook fc8. And the idea is very simple, that I want to put my rook on a nice, a nice file. And it also, you know, contests this idea of knight d5. Because knight d5 now doesn't really do very much. Queen d8 is a possibility if I want to be quite safe. But even a move like queen e8 is fine. And again, if the knight moves back, of course, I'm not that unhappy. And if they take this pawn and I take here, I think black's very active and should be, should be just fine. Uh, probably white should play a building move like rook d4, uh, so now knight f6, for example, queen d3, and now probably a move like h6, just chill. Uh, moves like, you know, doubling rooks is possible. Eventually b5 sometimes is an idea. Again, playing mainly for activity. But basically, I would say that white's still a little bit better, but most likely black should be, black should be doing okay. A transfer of queen b7 is very typical. It's a very nice square for the queen usually in these positions because it guards your, your potential weak pawns. White has the file, though, and for the moment, this knight can't use this square. But at the same time, white can't really advance uh, his majority. So again, maybe slightly better for white, but nothing too, too tragic. He played rook fd8, which looks like a very rational move trying to challenge this file. 
But he either underestimated or missed knight d5 completely. I, I would say underestimated is more likely. Because he played queen f8. Knight takes b6. So things liquidate a lot. But the problem now is that after queen d4... Okay, first of all, you're down a pawn. But also, you you don't... It's not so easy to gain it back while maintaining your activity. And I say that with an asterisk, while maintaining your activity. I would say that if there's a theme to this game, it is the importance of getting active counterplay, making your pieces active. So he plays rook b4, which is a very active move by itself. So here, I think Mickey could have actually played a little bit better. So he played the move queen e5, which is logical, but... He ends up losing his B pawn, which is fine. He still has some possibilities. But I would say that giving up the A pawn is better. And what I mean by that is he could play C4 with the idea that after Rook C8, Rook C1, you, you can simply let them take here. And now you have different options. Probably the simplest is just B3, Rook C3. And again, because the C pawn, I think, is more dangerous than any pawn black has, because this guy is maybe slightly weak, I would give white a, you know, an okay advantage here. You know, nothing, nothing winning, but probably very solid. Instead, he plays queen e5, queen c8, rook d2, f6, which is fairly a, a pretty accurate move. But basically, his idea is simply to win this b pawn, which he does, rook a d1. But even here, I would say that because, because the white black king now is slightly drafty, uh, f6 is a double edged move because you win this pawn, but you also weaken some squares uh, for your king. And because white has this file, the b-file, I'd say, is less consequential because the d-file, there's moves like rook d7 and rook d6, which make a lot of active threats. I would say the d-file is more important. I still give white a slight edge, but it's still not anything too severe. So in this position, actually, this was also an important move, which I think he got wrong. So I would say that if you guys, again, want to pause your video and find a, a nice move for black, uh, please do so. Definitely take your time. I think that it's a it's a crucial move and, and not an easy one. But if I can give you a hint, it's the importance of active counterplay. So go ahead and do that again if you wanna if you wanna uh, make this interactive. Uh, for those of you who are just wanna sit there and be bathed in my insights, <laughs> that didn't it's probably not a good idea. In any case, the the move which I like is rook a b eight. And the idea is very simple. You want to basically get a pair of rooks off. Because with all this material on the board, your king only becomes weaker. So the idea is to get a pair of rooks off almost at all costs, and to do so while also maintaining activity of your pieces. And again, this is the key part of this, activity of your pieces. So the point is, he probably looked at this move, but was scared by this. And it's a scary move, because if you dropping e6 with check looks quite scary. But the fact is, I think that you should do it. Play rook b1. So you allow him to take on e6 with check. However, I would say that this pawn is... Not that it's unimportant, because obviously it's important. But making sure your pieces get very active is more important. And here, believe it or not, white's pieces are completely tied up. Because of all these pins and the back rank issues, white has to play defensively now. So queen e7 doesn't look like a defensive move, but the idea is to force black to take on d1, which black will. So, of course, taking on c2 immediately would be quite an unfortunate decision. But instead, you just play h6. So, again, queen takes c2 now is clearly a threat. So, white would probably retreat. You play f5. You have to be cautious with moves like this. But, again, the idea is that you want to chase the queen away from c2. So, it goes to d3. And now, a move like rook b4. And you can see why black is very likely to draw now. Because... Your rook is extremely active. Rook c4 takes c2 is, very, is an idea. Taking this a pawn very simply is also an idea. And it just takes white too long because white has to create luft at some point and then generate threats. And I think for the moment, black looks extremely solid. So I think that white's chances of holding this position are extremely high. And it's also quite clear that an endgame is going to be extremely drawish. Because first of all, white has to spend a move create, um, making luft. So you can even just take a pawn and... It's not even close. It's not even clear you're better. So, instead he played king h8, which is a very sensible move to make sure that taking on e6 is not with a check to get off the diagonal. But it also does renew back rank issues, so it's not a completely... Uh, it's, a, it's not a move completely free of drawbacks, let's say. 
So here, Mickey actually could have played slightly more uh, precisely. As I said, I, I don't think he was on his usual form. This is the kind of position he's usually very good with, where he has, you know, a very slight initiative, you know, safer king. He can play against his opponent's weaknesses. Um, that isn't to say it's it's so simple, but he played h3, which is a very sensible move. But I think rook d7 is actually quite reasonable here. So the idea, of course, if you allow a move like queen g4 or something like this, it could be very unfortunate if you're not careful. It's important to note that back rank tricks don't really work uh, moves like this because because the rook can the rook can slide back. Uh, it's always very important though to keep track when you have a mid luft. So a move like rook a b8 I still like and rook b1, but it's not as clear now. For example, white can play king h2. So the idea now, of course, is that there's no more pin uh, on the d on the first rank. So white would take uh, black would take rather. And the problem here is that because white has secured this rook on the 7th, the, a pawn, the, the c pawn can maybe start running, the queen can go to d6. I still think that white has a pretty nice edge. But you can see how in the other line, the only difference was white was behind a, a couple tempi with the king. The king was on g1, the pawn was on h2, and black was missing an e-pawn. But because white had to retreat with the pieces, because black was able to play actively rather than having to play passively, the pawn is more than enough of a cost. So it's actually quite an, quite an interesting thing and something to take note of because I can tell you that it happens quite frequently that a pawn is not worth the value of activity of all your pieces. There are cases where the pawn is more valuable, but I would say that in a lot of cases, especially if the pawn's not doing anything too important at the moment, that the activity is much more important. So it's important when you're playing these games to really decide like how much you value your activity. And I would say that a position like this, like the value of activity, because your king's slightly weaker, because white has a passed pawn, the value of activity is extremely high. So white played h3 instead, black played h6, rook d6. And here, Grandelius, I think, played quite well. He doubled his rooks and then retreated, which looks like a passive move. But the, real, the idea is you really want to make sure you can trade these guys. So white played rook d7, and here he retreated. Maybe not the only move, but it's a very understandable one from my point of view. He really wants to get pieces off, and he understood the value of getting these rooks traded. So here Mickey could have taken on a6, which wasn't uh, a terrible decision, I think. But after rook takes, takes, you have some choices. So going for the rook endgame, I actually think here is a little bit dangerous. And the main reason is because, okay, you have to, you obviously have to defend your queen. Rook c7, takes, takes, and oftentimes positions like this are closer to a draw than a win. But the problem you have here is because your pawn is on f6, it gives white extra avenues in. For example, the king can now come in. The rook on a7 will be extremely annoying uh, targeting this g-pawn. So while it's possible you can still draw this position, I think that is actually closer to a loss quite often with a pawn on f6. So you have to be very, very careful about trading into these endgames. With the pawn on f7, with the normal structure of f7, g6, h5, the king on g7, usually it's closer to a draw than a loss. Uh, again, it, it, always losing chances. This is never a fun thing to do. But just something to note, because oftentimes you can trade into a rook endgame down a pawn and draw easily. This is definitely not the case here. Uh, black can take on c2, though, and this is probably good enough. So the idea would be that if you take on a6, I actually just play rook b2. And I, again... It's all about activity of the pieces and forcing uh, ac active play. So probably white would have to trade the queens here. But now, because the rook is on d4, at a much less active square than a7, I think that now black's probably closer to a, to a draw. For example, you play g5, king g6. I, I would say that black should, should almost certainly draw this game. Mainly because it's very hard for the king to approach. This rook doesn't have a stable square defending the king side pawn and the queen side pawn so that the king can run. The king cannot run because black's just going to take all your stuff. So I would say this is, this is extremely close to a draw and would be quite a reasonable option. But you can see the amazing difference between the rook endgames. In any case, I, I understand why Mickey declined to go for this and played c4 instead. So here, it's actually already kind of a tricky situation. He took on d6, which I think is, is sensible. Um, I think the computer actually prefers this move a5, but this is a very hard move to play. So this is not something, 
you know, for example, when I look at these games, I try to think of what's, you know, how do people lose and what are reasonable things to expect. And sometimes the computer can lie to you and say a move like A5, oh, is clearly best and whatever. But the fact is that a move like this to me is not, not a very natural move because you're allowing queen E4 and now all of a sudden rook D7's in the air. So you have to play a move like F5, queen E5. And basically it wants you to just say, ah, put a rook on G8. <laughs> no problem. So you allow, you know, takes on a5 is is usually possible. Uh, but white could even just kind of keep this kind of bind. But the fact is that to know that you can put a rook on g8 is not always such an easy thing. Because there are so many situations where you put a rook on g8 and then you end up just getting checkmated or you have no activity and it's just very, very annoying. But probably that was slightly better. He took on d6. And here there's a really nice resource. Again, if you guys want to pause your video and try to find it, there's a really nice resource for black to be able to defuse some of white's threats here. So if you'd like to pause in and figure it out, go ahead. Otherwise, I'm going to continue. So black played e5, which looks okay, but the fact is that this is a moment where you have to stay active. Active Activity is just at an absolute premium here because... If you allow your king to stay under attack with the c-pawn coming, you are just lost. So white, black had the really nice tactical possibility of check followed by rook here. With the very sneaky idea, of course, that if you take this rook, which probably white should, I don't think white has anything better, you give this check. So king g1, I think, is an accurate move now followed by c5. And this position is still not a dead draw. Uh, for example, if you take and take, this a-pawn gets rolling, it's actually not that simple. So, but you, your queen is also quite active, because here you, you can't go to h2 without allowing a perpetual, right? So instead, you, you have to go back to f1, queen goes to c3, and because black's queen is quite active, it's weird because, you know, white's not even up a pawn, but I would say that if the pawn gets too far, it can be very dangerous. But because black's quite active and the queen is better for the moment than, than white's queen, I would say that black's chances of drawing are, are reasonable. Another approach, which I also think is not terrible, is to play queen c6, and you try for more of a blockade approach. You play a move like this. White well, can play here, for example, because again, if you take, it's, it's kind of similar. But now black approaches the, the c-pawn. So trying king g8, king f7, and just trying to hold the fort. And it, it's hard. Like I, I don't know whether this is viable or not, whether this can draw or not, but... It would also be quite a reasonable approach. But I think that black had to realize that, okay, I need these rooks off. I need to get some form of activity because if I don't, I'm in trouble. And, and the game really showed it because now after queen e4, black played a5, rook d5, very nice move. g3, it probably wasn't necessary. A move like c5, I think, is maybe more accurate. But okay, Mickey likes to have a nice king. Rook c8, c5. And again, we can kind of see that all of a sudden black is just sitting here. So I would say that there are positions, and this is a really important lesson, I guess, from this game, which is that there are positions where sitting is just your best tactic. If any move makes your position clearly worse, then oftentimes sitting is just the way to go. But there are times when sitting is not good. And this is one of them. The reason being because if, if you... If your opponent has a clear, has many, many clear paths to improvement. Here, black can advance the c-pawn, create threats against your king, play moves like king g2 and advance the pawn to h5. Because white has so many avenues of improvement, and because your position is going to get stressed to the max, if you sit, you simply allow your opponent all this time, free time to, you know, basically improve their position to the point where you can't defend all your weaknesses. So because this position is of that type, you absolutely cannot play passively. Sometimes you have to play passively for a few moves, you know, not do anything too active, but you have to seek out activity pretty much at all costs in a position like this. There are positions, again, where you don't have enough weaknesses, where any idea just weakens your position, where you should sit. This is just not one of those situations. So deciding whether a position is one to sit or one to strive for activity is a very important skill and not an easy one. But you always want to be trying to, to toe this line. Because in this position, I think it was very important to stay active. He played queen b8, which, okay, it looks like his queen's come, trying to come out. But really, it can't go anywhere. Uh, I prefer the move queen e7. So the idea now is that if white tries to advance the c-pawn with a move like queen c4, you can at least play e4, e3. And again, 
probably white's still doing really well, but at least you're getting counterplay. You're, you're trying to open up white's king, make white less secure. And that's another thing. If you can find a way to make your opponent's king less secure, even if they're still winning, even if the position is still horrible for you, you often will get counter chances because no one likes to play with an open king. With very few exceptions. Anyway, white, uh, black played here, queen f5. And again, not, not all these moves are necessarily so accurate, but I want to just kind of show you how it happened. And again, I don't know the time situation. He could have had no time here. Either Both players could have had no time. So I don't want to judge the moves too harshly. I, I, it's more that I want to illustrate like what can happen when you when you make um these kind of decisions so black played queen b7 which is quite reasonable but rook d6 again the pawn is immune to capture because the weak black king and back rank mate so queen c7 and now a really nice move c6 and all of a sudden black's just dead uh, you would love to take this rook but white would take with check play a very precise move queen f5 maybe not even necessary but the idea is, of course, if g6, queen d7, check wins. And if you go back, queen d7 still wins, because c7, c7. So he played queen b8, and now it was just over. So this is the thing. Because black has no counterplay whatsoever, yes, white could maybe win quicker. But white does not have to win quickly. White can just secure the position, and you're basically going to be completely defenseless. So he plays h4, queen e6, h5. So this is kind of the, the ultimate danger of when you don't get counterplay. Basically, because white has endless paths to improve the position, and your king eventually will not be holdable, you're basically just, you know, signing your own death warrant when you when you do this. So it's something to watch out for. Queen b8, rook d7. He does get in a check, but unfortunately that's all it is. Rook f8, queen g4, c7. And after queen b6, he finishes the game very nicely with rook takes pawn check. With the idea, of course, that if you take, I play queen f5 check followed by c8 queen with check. So, again, a very instructive game, I think, from the white point of view, but also from the black point of view. Uh, if you can take away anything from this game, it's that you have to know when you need, when activity is absolutely required, when solid, you know, just sitting kind of play will not hold a position. And to do all you can to seek it out, whether it means sacrificing a pawn, whether it means opening up your own king a little just to activate your pieces, whether it, you know, whether it means just you have to trade off their active pieces. Uh, sometimes that's all you can do. But piece activity was really at a premium in this game, and because white black played a little slowly, because black played moves like e5, uh, it just really made the defense impossible. And also, as a side note, the things in the opening, like making sure you spot your opponent's main ideas, like e5 was a main idea, knight d2, c4 was a main idea. And even if you don't figure out everything perfectly, to spend a couple minutes figuring out where you want your pieces, where they want your, their pieces, and to at least have a response to moves like e5. If you don't have a clear plan on how to respond, uh, clearly Grandelius did with what he did. But for those of you, if you do not have a clear plan on how to respond, you can get a worse position very quickly. And end up suffering for a game. Uh, and that's definitely something that's happened to me. So I know firsthand you do not want to allow it. Um, but again, definitely a player to, to look for. Uh, Grandelius, when you see him in a tournament. Uh, really, really interesting interesting style. Interesting openings. Interesting games. And uh, he's really fun to follow. So I would definitely recommend it. He played a really beautiful game uh, in that tournament. Also where he... It was against... Who was it against? It was against... Uh, knightish, I believe, and he actually checkmated him. <laughs> he he had like a forced checkmate where he allows his opponent to take all his pieces. It was pretty awesome. So if you guys want to check out that game, uh, please do. It, it was a really beautiful game. In any case, uh, that's it for this one. Uh, I'll try to make these a, a slightly more regular occurrence than they have been. Uh, and uh, again, thank you for your uh, support of this channel. If you if you want to support it more, you can check out my uh, Patreon page, which is given in the link. And I also will usually post updates as far as like when I'm going to do videos, what the videos are going to be about, and all of that. So thank you again for watching this video, and uh, ch ch see you next time.